you speak yet now to us in and through the word of God to encourage us, oh God, and to help us to understand what you would have us to know. And we're going to give your name of praise today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says amen. 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 So glad to have everybody here this morning. Glad to see all the visitors, deacons, saints, and friends. Amen. 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 Thank God for everybody making their way out today on this rainy Sunday morning. Amen. 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 But God is good. Amen. Would you grab your copy of God's Word and help me navigate with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. It's there. We will find our message today in Ephesians, chapter 1. If you don't have it, you have it on the screen. Ephesians, chapter 1. Looking at verse 15 through 22. Let's read it together. It says this, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised from the dead and seated, raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, him as head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. This morning I want to speak on this subject, a pastor's prayer for his people. I want to speak on this subject this morning, a pastor's prayer for his people. A pastor's prayer for his people. I'm here, brother. Thank you. A pastor's prayer for his people. Orange juice. That's what I needed on Wednesday. Some orange juice. It was my responsibility to bring orange juice to the birthday party of one of our co-workers. And it was upon arriving, getting to my desk, and clocking in that I realized I did not have my orange juice. I totally forgot. In the back of my mind, I said, okay, we can remedy this. I can go to the ATM, which is in, at our job, and I can pull some cash, and I can run and get some orange juice quickly before this birthday breakfast begins. But to my horror, realized I did not have my ATM card. <laughs> Everything that I need is available for me, but I don't have my ATM card. The cash is there because I got some money in the bank. I can access my bank from the ATM, but the only problem is I don't have my ATM card. And it is true with us as Christians that you and I have great access to heavenly things. But the way we access those things is with our ATM card called prayer. Our ATM card, ATM card called prayer. And Jesus is the access code. I put in his code and say, in the name of Jesus. And I have access to the throne of grace. Paul understands this, and he says to his church here in Ephesians that I know something about prayer, and I want you to know that in order for you and I to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it will take prayer to bring about all the things that God has in store for you in this life. Mm -hmm. Prayer is the access to where we get all of God's blessings, all of God's understanding, all of God's yeah. direction in life. It is through prayer. Amen. Paul understands this, and this is what he wants to convey to his people, that, listen, I am praying for you. Mm -hmm. Paul wants to convey to his people, the church he planted, he's wanting to tell them, here's a pastor's prayer for you. I am praying Several things that we're going to look at in this text, but I'm praying that God would open you up and he yes. would pour out all his riches on you. But Paul tells us, really, this happens not through more intellect, 
We can preach from the Word of God. We can open up the Scriptures. We can divide this, that, and third. But I tell you, the greatest impartation comes when you and I spend time with God in prayer. Amen. I want to look at only two things this morning. I want to divide our time into two sections. One, I want us to notice uh, Paul's reason for this prayer. And number two, we'll look at Paul's request in this prayer. Paul's reason for this prayer and Paul's request in this prayer. And here's our first point as we look in Paul's reason for this prayer. Paul's reason for this prayer is that, listen, he has come to this church. He planted this church in Ephesians or Ephesus. This church Paul has planted and it said that he uh, stayed there probably the longest out of all of his journeys. Out of all the places he stayed, he stayed in Ephesus about three years. And he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. In one context, he says, I didn't withhold anything from you. I gave you my life. I gave you, I, I, he said, I gave you the whole counsel of God. I didn't pick and choose text. I didn't pick and choose my favorite verse. I didn't just tell you God will bless you. I also told you that God is a, he's a tough dude. He's a good father. He's a, he's a, he's a disciplinarian. I gave you the entire counsel of God, he says. And so he's telling that, he told that to his church in Ephesus. And then when he left, he left his son in the faith, Timothy, in charge. And this letter is written not to rebuke anyone. This letter is not written to, to address any kind of issue here. It's just a father or a pastor reaching out to the congregation and saying, I just want to remind you about some things. I want to first encourage you to let you know that I am praying for you. Amen. And that there is a pastor's prayer for you. And so his reason for this prayer is pretty uh, laid out for us in a few verses that I want you to look at with me. And Paul's reason for this prayer, he says, listen, for this reason... He says, I'm praying for you. He says, number one, Paul heard of their discipleship. For in the text, he opens up and says, I heard of your faith in the Lord and your love for all the saints. Paul says, I heard. I'm sending prayers. I'm just encouraging that God, sending you encouragement that God wants to do more and keep you going deeper in him. He says, I'm praying that because of what I heard about you. I heard about your discipleship, that you have faith in the Lord yes. and that you have love for the saints. Right. Church, that goes hand in hand. Amen. You can't love the Lord and dislike people. Amen. Yeah, you Amen. can't love the Lord with all of your heart and hate the ones who God made with his hands. Right. He helps us to understand. He says that Jesus says that to us. He says, how can you love me whom you've never seen and yet hate your brother or your sister whom you see every day? He says this thing, it cannot be because when God saves you, he transforms your heart. Right. Make no mistake about it. There are some people that get on your first, Amen. middle, and last nerve. Amen. 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 They, they get there. They, they show up there. They stay there. They lay down right there. Right. There's someone that bother you, bother me too. But I still, you still, if you've been converted, do have a genuine love. And watch this. It, this is how you know. This is how you know this transformation right. in your heart. Watch this. That you can pray for them that you don't like. Amen. Right. Jesus pushes it even further. It says, not only do you pray for them you don't like, but you pray for those who don't like you. Amen. But he told us to pray for our enemies and to do good to our enemies. He even told us to do this. Love your enemies. Oh, my goodness. It's in the Bible. I didn't make it up. So he, he says to them, listen, his reason is Paul heard of the discipleship that they had genuine faith in the Lord. This faith in the Lord was a believing faith. It was a believing faith. They were unto belief. They believed in Christ Jesus and were saved. But not only was it enough to believe, it was a persevering faith. Because they were enduring any kind of obstacle that came to them in this place, Ephesus. Ephesus is a great place. It's a huge city. It's in Rome. It's where today we have, listen, we have the Olympics today. Rome was the beginning of Olympics. There they had great games that were played. They had a 20,000 seat arena there. They had uh, places where they had a big field for arenas. They, I mean, they had it all because in that time, they loved the games and they played the games. It was a great city, but it also had this huge temple to a goddess named Diana, who was a really sexual goddess, and they worshipped that goddess very heavily. It was a very prosperous city, but it was also a very pagan city, a wicked city. And Paul is still trying to encourage his people, even with all that's going on, you guys have genuine faith, and listen, you've kept the faith. That's right. You're keeping the faith. You're persevering yes. in the faith. He said this is his reason Paul heard 
about their discipleship. Secondly, Paul believed in heaven, a heavenly deposit. Verse 17, he says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He understands, listen, God gives us all things. Right. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. above. God gives us all things, and whatever he says that we need is going to come from him. Paul realizes this and said, I can't even give you, I can't make you, I can't bless you, but I tell you, I know the one who can. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm praying for you that the God of our Father would give you what you need, right. not necessarily what you want. Amen. Because the truth of the matter is, all of us need to grow in Christ Jesus. Amen. None of us have reached that place where we got it all, we know it all, and we've done it all. But all of us have some things that we, we are still in need for God to bring us up to. And Paul is saying, let's recognize that, that God gives us that. Here's the third thing I want you to see quickly. Not only did Paul believe in a heavenly deposit, that it all comes from God, but Paul says he knew the heart's depth. The depth of our heart. Here's where all change happens. Look at this verse again in verse uh, 18. He says, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened that you may know what is. Period right there. He says, having the eyes of our heart, as though to say our heart has eyes to see. Everything that transpires in the Christian life starts in the heart, church. Everything that transpires, real change starts on the inside. That's why you can't browbeat people into being saved. That's why you can't condemn people into being saved. That's why you can't uh, fool people into being saved. Be mean to folks. That's not where true transformation happens. It happens in the heart. You can talk Bible all day long, but if your heart, if you're mean hearted and evil hearted, that Bible means absolutely nothing. When salvation comes, it's more than a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. Yes. You now say, not only do I believe in God, but I believe God. Uh -huh. Not only do I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe what Jesus said about me, and I believe yes. what Jesus yes. did for me. Yes. Reverend, what did he say about me? Well, he said that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. Yes. And he said in order to be saved, I had to accept what Jesus did on the cross, right. which was to die for my sins. Right. And if I believe that he died for my sins and receive him in my heart, I will yes. have everlasting and eternal right. life. And so I believe that. And so he says the real transformation begins where? In the heart. And so what he says now, I'm praying though that God would open up your eyes to see all the spiritual things that God has in store for you. I'm praying that God would open up your spiritual understanding that you would not just see it as a natural person, but see it as God sees it. Because you need to know one more thing before I go is that this this world which we live in today is temporary. That's right. That's what we do not see is te not temporary. It is permanent. It is the real deal. Mm -hmm. Reverend, I, I, I just can't believe that. I'm trying to tell you, when you die, you don't just poof and go away. No, you go to, and to live in the real atmosphere, the real place, the real heaven, the real hell. This uh, body which we live in will decay. It is temporary. Everything we got. Metal rust, money will go, uh, it loses its value. But I tell you, nothing yes. in the kingdom of God, church will lose its value because Amen. it is not temporary. It is, uh, it is immortal. So he shows us these quick, three quick things here. Paul's reason for this prayer, he heard of their discipleship. He believed in the heavenly deposit, but then Paul knew the heart's death. Eternal transformation begins in the heart. But then secondly, notice this, and we'll move quite move on really quickly. Paul's request in this prayer. Notice Paul's request in this prayer. Paul says this in this that God knows uh, that He wants us to know God's glorious attributes. Here's, he's praying and saying, "Listen, I, here's the first thing I want you to see. Why I'm praying for you. I, here's my request for you." I don't want you to give your life to Jesus and do absolutely nothing. Amen. I don't want you to become saved and say to yourself, well, I got my ticket to heaven and I'm good. Uh -huh. I don't want you to just 
uh, say I'm a Christian and I go to church when I want to. I do whatever else I want to. And as long as I know me and Jesus are all right, I, I'm not doing anything for the Lord because I already took care of that. So, I mean, God, he's saying, I want you to go deeper than this. I want you to be deeper than this. I want you to know all that God wants you to do. He may not make you rich, but I tell you, if you do all that he wants you to do, you will be rich. Amen. Maybe, maybe not with money. Let me make sure I clarify that. You might not hit the jackpot. Your ship might not come in, but I tell you, there is eternal riches that are stored up for us that does not decay. It doesn't fall. It lasts forever. So he says, here's the first thing. I want. I pray God opens your understanding and that he gives you this spirit of revelation that, listen, that God, that you'll know God's glorious attributes. Verse 17, he says this, may, he says, he may he give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This word wisdom, it most likely is meaning that uh, he's talking about wisdom of spirit. He's talking about an attitude that God wants us to have. That God gives us an, a discerning attitude when it comes to the things of God. He's saying, I'm hoping you have this mindset. Just like a cheerleader gives a student body a, a spirit of enthusiasm. We used to go to booster club or we used to go to um, uh, uh, pep rallies right before a big game. And they'd go in there and, and one side of the, the bleachers, one side of the gym, when I got spirit, yes I do. And we got spirit, how about you? And they throw it back to the other side of the room while I got spirit. And it goes back and forth and everybody's getting hyped up so we can go to the game and celebrate and have a good time. Paul is saying, I'm praying you have this same kind of attitude. Right. excitement about God and the things of God because you need, listen, the life, Christian life is not a uh, boring life it is not an empty life, it is a life full of life and vigor and activity and doing the things of God, so he says I'm praying that you have this wisdom this wisdom that is an insight into true things true things, the wisdom that is an insight to true things, so you will know uh, what's truly important that your priorities are being in the right place. Mm -hmm. What's really important, true things like your money and your time. What's really <coughs> true, what really makes sense in your life. This wisdom is not a cause and effect, but this wisdom is that he would have us to stand in knowledge and understanding of what's true. Amen. So not only is this wisdom that we have this attitude of, uh, of knowing, wanting to know God, but his revelation, he says, the same text, he give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Revelation means to reveal, to unfold, or to unveil. This, this is not God saying, or Paul saying, I'm praying that God will give you a new revelation from the scriptures. That God will give you, he will create this revelation that nobody else has ever heard of before. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm praying that when you read the scriptures, when you spend time with God, that he will open up to you what the scriptures are saying. Yes. Amen. He's saying, I'm praying that you would understand what has been written. You and I can't understand it by ourselves, but he says the Spirit of God in you will help open up the eyes of your heart that you might understand what God is trying to communicate to you. A lot of people say to me, Reverend, I'm trying to hear God. I'm trying to hear the voice of the Lord. I heard this or I heard that, and I say, man, man that's, that's great. That's great. How can I hear more of God's voice? I'll tell you how you do it. Go back to the Word of God. And, and when you read it, you're going to hear his voice. Well, what will it sound like? <laughs> It'll sound like his word. Well, is that a high pitch or a low pitch? No, it, it sounds like what he said in the book. Because a lot of voices have gone out into the world. A lot of folk hearing stuff saying, God told me to do this, and they kill their children and blame it on God. No, he says, here's the best defense is the best guideline that you could possibly have. It's God's holy word. And the more you know of his word, the more revealed uh, knowledge you have in his word, you know when the devil's trying to tell you something foolish. Amen. You know when you're about to encounter a situation because you say, you know, I read this in the book. The Bible talks about lying. I read this in the book. The Bible talks about deceiving. I read this in the book. The Bible talks about uh, watching what, you, what comes out of your word, the mouth, the words that come out of your mouth. By man's words, he shall be justified or condemned. I, I didn't make that up. I found it in the book. There it is. So he says, I'm praying God gives you revelation in the holy word of God. And so you, you and I may know who God is. God, listen, he's saying, I'm praying that you know God's glorious attributes. What do you know about God today? What do you know about God? Not what you heard. I'm talking about what you know. What you've experienced. That you've experienced that God has been changing you. You can, you can testify to that because God has been doing it in your life. What do you know 
about God? Do you know what makes God angry? Do you know what makes God happy? Do you know if you God is pleased with you? Do you know? How do you feel about the whole thing of fasting and praying? Are you fasting trying to please God? Or do you understand that we fast and pray because we are already pleasing to God? But you, you, someone says, well, I, I, that's why I joined the church, so I could be saved. And God, he says, I want you to know something deeper than that. You got saved, that's why we joined the church. After we got saved, we joined the church. We didn't join the church to be saved. We gave our heart to Jesus and then joined the church. Right. He, he wants us to understand things a little bit deeper than what we have been thinking. And the question remains, what do you know about God? About how he feels about you? Did you know you are the apple of his eye? Yeah. Did you know how much he cares for you? That he knows the number of hairs on your head or maybe yeah. that are not on your head or the hairs you wish you had? But God knows all about you. Yes. And he says, listen, I want you to know about me. Yes. You may not know, you will not know everything there is to know about God. Because there's some stuff he does that I can't figure out. Yes. I'm not called to figure him out. I'm called to trust God. Yes. And so what he says, I want you to know me. I want you to know me that I'm a good God. I want you to know me that I'm firm, that I'm, I'm tough. I want you to know me though, that I'm honest, that I'm just, I'm true, that I'm dependable, that I'm loving, I'm caring, I'm strong, I'm mighty. I don't trick, I don't play games, I don't fool people. You need to know that's in God's word. He tells us who he is. He is a deliverer. He's a mind regulator. He's peace and he's joy. And he'll be trouble to your enemies and he'll be, he'll be your best friend. The Bible says he's a friend that's still closer than a brother. So it's not enough for us just to know God as our Savior. We got to know him as our Father. We got to know him as our friend. We got to know him as our God, as our comforter. And he tells us in 2 Peter 3, 18, so grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we learn him or learn his attributes and know how his glorious attributes, church, Paul says, man, that's my prayer for you. If you can know him, you'll start growing. Anytime you start facing trouble, you, you, you won't just end it with, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You'll, you'll end it with, uh, but blessed be the name of the Lord. you say he's good, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And so he helps us to understand that. My children, we were uh, with the children yesterday, and we were having a good time. And, uh, and uh, we were, uh, I got my information mixed up as it related to riding rides. I thought... I didn't pay because I didn't pay. I couldn't ride, but if my child was underage, I could ride with my with my child. And so I I, I didn't figure that out towards the end. So <laughs> brother Frankie and brother Esmont were taking my children and and they were riding the go karts and, and it was all I was getting pictures and everything was good. And then I figured out what I could do. So uh, I I had at that time I had Peyton. So we got into this the race cars and we raced and raced and raced. But I knew I know my daughter. My daughter's not going to let that thing slide. You took Peyton, Daddy. You got it. I, I, so I knew it. I knew it. So I, I went ahead. As soon as the ride was over, sure enough, I saw her coming. And I just made a, a, a U-turn and we went back in the ride or got back on the ride because why? I know my daughter. I know what's in her. I know where she was going to go with that. So because of that, I knew what I needed to do. So can you, brothers and sisters, when it comes to your knowledge of God. You have, when you have a, a, a more glorious uh, a knowledge of who the Lord is, you can ride those storms. You say, I know the Lord is with me. I know the Lord's going to keep fighting the battle with me. I know the Lord's not going to leave me alone. I know, I know the Lord. I, and that's what God wants some folk to get to the point in your life. You say, I know the Lord. I, not my granddaddy told me, no, I know the Lord. I know him for myself. I got to move on with this. And not only do we see this, uh, this glorious, uh, this glorious, uh, uh, his glorious attributes, and notice this also with me, know God's glorious assurance. Paul says, I, I want you to know God's glorious assurance. Verse 18, he says this, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. It's a glorious assurance is what he says. He says this is glorious because uh, you and I need to understand that God wants us to have assurance in our faith and in our salvation. That he is, he, he that has begun a good work in you. Watch this. He will finish it. 
He will complete it. He that has started you on it. He that has called you. He that he put his hands on you. He saved you. He, he messed with you if you want to say it like that. He got your attention. Wouldn't let you be. Wouldn't leave you alone. And he drew you to himself. He did that. He said, I'll work with you to make sure you be exactly what I've called you to be. God doesn't start anything and he doesn't finish. God, whatever he starts, he finishes. God is not a dad that has children all over the place and he don't take care of them. God takes care of his own. So notice this. First of all, what is this call? It is a divine call. Throughout the scriptures, Paul kept telling what kind of call this was. It's a call, it's a call by grace. He says in Galatians 1 and 15, he says, But but even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Not only a call by grace, but it's a call to holiness. Paul told his son, his son Timothy in the faith, he says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time. It's not only a, a call by grace or a call to holiness, it's a call to salvation. First Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. He said not only that, it's a call to glory. He says this from 1 Peter 5, 10, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. It's a divine call is what he's saying. And he says, I'm praying to you. I'm praying to God that you would have this glorious, you know God with his glorious assurance. He wants you to be assured of your salvation. He wants you to be assured that you're on your way to heaven. John even said, these things I write to you that you may know that you have eternal and everlasting life. This divine call, it's a divine call, but then not only that, what is the hope of this call? That's what he said, there is the hope of this call. This call, it, this hope is a divine hope also. First Peter, first uh, John says this, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we, uh, and he says, what we will be has not yet appeared. Yes. But we know no. that when he appears, we shall see him. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Here's the hope, church. Listen, all that we go through, our hope is that one day we're going to see Jesus. Amen. Let me try one more time just in case. Maybe I said clearly. One day the hope of every Christian who's been sick, who's been battling, who's been fighting, who's been faithful, every, the hope of every Christian who's lost a loved one, who's had to deal with trauma and drama, the hope of every Christian is that one day we will be like him or we shall, watch this, see him as he is. wants us to know this glorious assurance. We're going to see him. We're going to see him as he is. There was a lady by the name of Florence Chadwick who was, uh, she was swimming in this uh, race. She wanted to, uh, she was in the Catalina Islands and she was swimming from uh, and one end to the other and it was a long grueling race. It was a long grueling swim and it was, the water was ice cold and and there were even sharks in the water, and they fired pistols to scare the sharks that they would go away so she could swim. And so she got into the channel, and she was swimming, and 15 hours into the, wow. into the swim, she was, she was getting tired, and, and, and there was, it was thick fog, and, and just all kind of obstacles that were around her. And about 15 hours in, she said, I can't take any more. I need to come out of the water. And her coach says, no, you're almost there. You're just a half a mile there. You're going to make it if you keep on pushing. And she says, I just, I just can't take it no more. i got to get out of the water. And they pulled her out of the water. And, and then later on, they interviewed her. And they said, well, what happened? You were so close to reaching your destination. She says, I, was, I didn't know it. She says, because the fog was so thick, I couldn't see, watch this, the land. And because I couldn't see the land, I gave up. I didn't know how much longer I could go. I didn't see any hope. And so but then two months later, she decided she would do it again. It was a sunnier day, and she could see the land, and she got in, and she swam. She beat her own record, and, 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 and she made it across. And, and they said, well, how did you do it this time? She said, simply this time, I could see the land. And because I could see the land, that gave me hope. And watch this, church. It's the same way with you and me. If you can see one day... 
uh, being with the, the Lord, if you can see one day, hear him saying to you, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Every trial and tribulation, you can make it through. It. Every setback, you can make it through. It. Every disappointment, you can keep on making it through. It. Even in disagreements, you can keep on making it because you've got hope in front of you. So he says, I want you to listen to know the glorious hope. That's what Paul is praying, this pastor's prayer for this church. But then thirdly, notice this, know God's glorious abundance. Verse 18, we're walking through the text. He says this, he says, I want you to know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. This is what Paul is praying for his church. He wants his church to know some things. You know, church is it's a good time to come and shout and have a good time of worship. But at the end of the day, we want you to know something. Amen. That's yeah. right. Now, now I, you know I can't hoop like that. If I could hoop, every other, every, every at least once a month we would hoop for a long time. But I can't hoop. I just can't do it. Just I'm gonna get laryngitis and you know I'll need some antibiotics. So I, I can't hoop. But but my goal and my hope for you is when you leave is that you've gotten an understanding about God's word and you've, you've thought it through. And so Paul is saying the same thing. I don't want you to just have church or be in Christianity and don't have an understanding of what I want. He says, I want you to know something else. I want you to know about God's glorious abundance. Verse 18 says that you may know, really, he says, uh, what is his riches of his glorious inheritance in Christ Jesus. Did you know God is wealthy? Yes. But he's not wealthy because you give tithes and offerings. That's right. Amen. God is not wealthy because you, you give it tithes and offering. God does not need it. He does not need tithes and offering. He's wealthy because God owns everything. Uh, the earth is the Lord and the Lord. God owns everything. God's wealth, He owns everything, but that's not even what makes God wealthy. Here's what makes God wealthy. You and me. This text is talking about his riches, that inheritance. We are God's inheritance. We, back up, are God's inheritance. He died on the cross, listen, so that you and I could have access to God, that we could be made right with God, so that in that last and final day, church, when he called all of his children home, mm -hmm. we will be his inheritance. You think God wants to be in money, get, be in heaven with all, surrounded by all his money? That might be your dream, but that's not God's vision. That's not God's vision. God said, I, it's not money I want to be surrounded with. It's not all the land I want to be surrounded with. It's not all the mansions that God says I want to have. It's you, the people that I want to that's why Jesus says, let not your heart be true. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Then my Father's house will be in He says, I, He says, I told you this because I want you to know I'm coming back so you can be with me where I am. His greatest inheritance is not what he's created or what he's or, 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 or the, the things he's created. It's the people that he's put his spirit in. It's the people who are his inheritance. God is wealthy not because of the stuff, but because of us. And we are wealthy because we have an inheritance in God. Amen. We are wealthy. You say, I ain't got much money, Reverend. Trust me, if you're a believer and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, right. you have abundant wealth. Yes. You have God who's on your side and you have Him who's in your heart. And we will share this inheritance and the glory that is to come. I'm almost finished. He says in Colossians 3, 4, he says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so in Ephesians 1, 14, he says, So the Spirit of God is our guarantee that he will give you the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. You and I are his inheritance. So he says, I want you to know about this glorious assurance. That's why you don't have to spend up all your money trying to please the Joneses. Amen. You have who you need, and you have enough that you need. Amen. There are a few circumstances I know that need attention, but most of the time, you and I, if you believe it, you have who you need. And a lot of the times, we already have what we need. And he says, I don't want you to get caught up in this life. As my grandfather used to say, don't get tied up or tied down with the cares of this life that you know earthly good, you know heavenly good. You can't do anything for the Lord. You can't please him. You can't serve him because you got to work so hard to pay off all the stuff you keep accumulating because you're trying to please people. Preach, Reverend. Preach, Reverend. 
He says, when we get loaded down with the cares of this life, you, he says, you can't please me. You're missing out. You're going to miss out on my inheritance because every good thing you do for God, he breaks it down. Everything you do for him. He told one person, Jesus said to somebody, if you give a cup of water in my name, he said, you have a reward in heaven. Anything you do for Christ will last. Yes. It has eternal value. So he tries to help us to understand, listen, you have a glorious abundance that is available for you and I. He says, and Paul says, I'm praying that you know about that. Amen. No, no, no. I'm praying that you will believe that. Yeah. I'm praying that you would live for that. I'm almost done. I'm praying that you would get a better understanding of that, that you have a glorious inheritance. Listen, in God Almighty, he's provided for you. Amen. Uh, a young man and his dad, they went down to the market. And his dad said to his son, son, you've been real good this week. I want to bless you. He says, let's go down to this store. I want you to get some candy. And the, the young man, was, he was, the boy was so happy. He goes in there, and, and when he gets into the candy store, he sees this huge thing of candy, and his eyes are bulging. And the store clerk says, well, son, go ahead and help yourself. And the little boy got shy and says, no, no, no I, don't, I don't want to. And the daddy was kind of looking at him strange, like, boy, you ain't never been shy before when it came to candy. What's going on? And so the son, he, he says, well, go ahead, help yourself. And the little man said, no. And he pointed to him. He wanted the clerk to stick his hands in there and get it. So the clerk did. The clerk stuck his hands in there and pulled out the candy and gave it to the little boy. And the little boy was smiling. <laughs> Went back home. He was on his way home. The dad said, oh, son, why were you acting like that? After I, gave, after I told you to get the candy, why didn't you get the candy? He says, you've never been shy before. The little man said, he says, Daddy, he says, the store clerk's hand was bigger than mine. <laughs> and I knew he would pull out the one like me. Hey, listen. God's handing out blessings that are... <laughs> What you trying to hold on to and what you trying to fight yeah. for, it ain't worth it. God, when God, anything God puts in his hands, yeah. I want you to know it's bigger than what you can come up with. It's greater than what you can hang on to. You got to trust the Lord. Listen, and, and, and know he wants you to know his glorious abundance. Here's my last point, and I'm heading to my seat. He says, not only that, but I want you to know God's glorious authority. That God has glorious authority. Here's what he tells us in verse 19. He says, he says this, a couple of things, but dissect it real quick. Know this. He says, I want you to know God's glorious authority. That God has authority and it is described. He has authority and it is demonstrated. Verse 19 describes it. He says, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? Man, those are all descriptive words. He, he describes God's authority by saying this. Number one, his authority is immeasurable. Your translation may say is exceedingly uh, great. It's immeasurably great. God cannot be measured. He teaches us that God cannot be measured. And you know, when we have an earthquake, we judge the power of that on the Richter scale. 1 through 10, we know how powerful it is. They, we know the magnitude of it. That's what that word greatness means. It means magnitude. We know the magnitude of that earthquake. When we have a tornado, we have we, it's measured by an EF. It's able to tell us by the damage done by the wind to property. That's how we measure the power of a tornado. For a hurricane, we measure it uh, by calling it category 1 through 4. And it's determined how fast the wind is blowing. But God cannot be measured. Amen. There's nothing that can measure the greatness of God. He is immeasurable. And he said he's so great that he, he, is, he is magnificent and mighty. And he is, he is bigger than any 10 point anything on any scale. He cannot be measured. He describes his authority. He says not only did he use this word immeasurable greatness, but he also used power, which is a Greek word called dunamis. Where we get our English word dynamite, which simply means means God is raw power, church. Right. I'm just trying to tell you what Paul says. Paul says, I want you to know who God is. And all the trouble you face and all the issues that come your way, you need to know who God is. He's not weak. He's not on steroids either. God is immeasurable and he's all-powerful. And he says he's like raw power. 
Notice this, he also says, use this word working, which really means this word that we get our word energy from. God is like an a, 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 a energy builder. He's, he's pure energy. God is awesome right by himself. He also said he has great might, which means he has the ability to conquer. That's the description of God's authority. But then notice this finally, the demonstration of his authority. God said, and Paul says, I'm praying that you would understand the demonstration of his authority power, his authority, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 20. He used he used his same power to raise Jesus from the death, from the dead. And church, nobody can raise anybody from the dead but God. Amen. That's right. Yes. Nobody can raise anybody. No one can heal anybody but God. No one can deliver anybody but God. God has all power. So he says, notice this. Here's the, the authority. He says, the authority demonstrated God raised him from the dead. Number two, he not only raised him from the dead, but he seated Jesus at his right hand. It's in verse 20. He says, and seated him at the right hand in, watch this, heavenly places. Hebrews 7.25 says that he's sitting there ever making intercession for you and for me. He's just trying to help us understand, church, listen, the authority that's demonstrated. Not only did he do that, but God raised Jesus, watch this, far above all. That's what he says in the text. He raised Jesus far above all. He raised Jesus far above all powers and principalities. Listen, he raised Jesus above all kind of commanders, which was rulers and authorities. He raised him above all power and dominion and over every name that is named that can ever come in this age or the age that is to come. That means Jesus, God, raised Jesus and he is above every sickness and disease. He's above all lack. Above all anything that you can name on this earth, God is mightier, He's stronger. And Paul says, I want you to know it when the wind and the storms and the waves are blowing in your life, you need to know that God still can control the storms in life. You need to know that God is still in control. Nothing can get out of control in God's eyes and his life. So He helps us to understand that, that God is above it all. You and I don't have to fear anything that comes our way. That's right. I said we don't have to fear anything that comes our way. That's right. That's right. God help the Christians who we are continuously afraid of seeing Jesus. God help us that we don't have to fear anything that comes our way. God help us, Lord, that in whatever trial we face, Lord, we don't have to fear what they say. God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God says, I'll be with you. And I am your present help in the time of storm. God bless you. I'm done. I'm heading to my seat. Paul says, I'm praying for you. And Paul says, you don't have to fear anything. You don't have to fear anything. You and I don't have to fear not one single thing. If we just trust the Lord that he's on top of his game this morning. That God will fight every battle. And that if we trust him, listen, we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We'll see him do what he says he's going to do. But Paul says, listen to this, in order for us to see it, you and I got to call on the name of the Lord. We've got to pray that the Lord will open up our hearts. We must pray that the Lord would give us eyes, open eyes of understanding in our hearts so that we can receive what the Lord would have us to do. Can you say amen? Amen. So here's our application for the week. Usher's going to pass along this this little paper to you if you show my application up here on the screen. So here's our application for this week. Here's our application. This week, I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will help us to know God's attributes, His assurance, His abundance, and His authority. So I've written it out for you on what, on who to pray for Monday through through Sunday, from Saturday to Sunday, from Monday to Sunday. I wrote it down so that way, in case you didn't, you forgot or you only like praying for yourself. I wrote it down <laughs> who you could and should pray for. This week, I want you to focus on it because this is a real truth. Paul says, I want you to know it, and I, other folk need to know the same thing. So Monday, I want you to pray for yourself. Let's start off with you this week. You start off with yourself. Tomorrow morning, you say, Lord, help me. 
Help me to receive this. Help me to know. Open my heart, Lord, that I know the truth of your word. Tuesday, pray for your household, your husband, your family. Pray that they would get an understanding of who God is. Pray for some family members you know. Pray for them. Lift them up before the Lord. This same truth that they would know God. Wednesday, pray for uh, Thursday, pray for church family. The church members that they would know, especially the ones that ain't here today. Praise the Lord. Oh, pray for them today. Find their way back to the house of God. On Friday, pray for your co-workers. You know. You can't pray for yourself. You got to pray strictly for your co-workers. That they, listen, that God will reveal to them how much he loves them. That God will reveal to them that there's a way back from whatever sin that they've fallen into. Pray that God would do this for you. But then on some Saturday, pray for the leaders, the governmental leaders. We need leaders that know Jesus, at least care for people, that they want to do the right thing. And then on Sunday, we ought to pray for all those who are unsaved, that they would know Jesus Christ. That is what Paul is praying that God's people would do as they live on planet Earth. Until he comes. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for our time spent together with this truth. Lord, we're asking you, Lord God, to reveal yourself more to us. We don't need a new revelation. We just need to have the revelation revealed to us that's already in the word of God. Stir our hearts, oh God, and stir our minds, Lord, to want to know you. Lord, I don't believe this about perfection. I do believe this about direction. People who are seeking you for direction. Lord, we pray, Lord, that today, Holy Spirit, you would touch someone's heart, that they would sense your call, sense, Lord, that you are calling them to maybe salvation, or maybe to the work of the Lord, or maybe to just a deeper walk in you. God, this is a pastor's prayer for his people. God, and I pray that we will be done in Jesus' name. You desire prayer today, we want to pray with you. For any need, any issue you may be having, we're going to open the altar. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, this is a perfect time that you may get into a relationship with him. True, true, real. Not because you were baptized some years ago or, or that you prayed the prayer some years ago and you've never been never paid God any much mind, but now, today's the day, if you don't know Christ Jesus today, you can.